welcoming you all to today's uh, Alan Turing International Lecture Series Seminar. Uh, as uh, many of you will know who have been regular attendees, we've tried to, to give, and as the title implies, an international perspective on the trials and tribulations of the COVID epidemic over the last two years, and more positively and optimistically, the very many important contributions that quantitative methods research can uh, contribute to controlling this and informing us about future epidemics uh, with the idea of being better prepared next time than arguably many countries were for this. Um, we've, uh, of course, regard um, uh, the UK as a country and therefore it fits within of the international seminar series. And today we're having a lecture that has a UK focus, uh, although it's from a speaker whose international credentials are really uh, second to none. Uh, I first met Crystal when she was a research student at the University of Harvard in the Department of Biostatistics, working with Professor Nan Laird. And uh, I, I, um, you can tell how impressed I was at that first meeting because I tried unsuccessfully to persuade her to take a job at Lancaster University shortly afterwards. She showed commendable good sense in saying no thank you, going to Edinburgh and beginning what became a glorious career uh, in epidemiological modelling and quantitative methods generally at the interface of statistics and the population health sciences. And continuing that theme of working at the interface, she holds two chairs at two of our leading universities, uh, Oxford University, where she's in the Department of, Applied St the Department of Statistics as Professor of Applied Statistics, and Imperial College, where she is in the infectious disease epidemiology sphere. And she also, uh, as you will, many of you will know, was elevated to the Royal Society recently, a very well-deserved recognition of the many contributions she's made over her career to date, but she's not finished yet. And she's been very active in, amongst other things, the uh, REACT program led by um, Imperial College. And I'm very pleased that she's now going to give us uh, a summary of some of the work that's been going on on the REACT survey since the start of the epidemic. Crystal, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. Okay, yes, so I'm going to talk today about the REACT study and um, understanding SARS-CoV-2 transmission uh, using a national survey. Now, in this case, um, national actually refers to England. Now, we would have been very happy to do um, a UK-wide study or look at at least some of the other parts of the UK other than England, but England was the one for which we were funded. So that is where I will focus on today. Um, the REACT, which stands for Real-Time Assessment of Community Transmission, is actually a program of studies so that includes REACT-1, which was a set, and I just realized it's slightly out of date, but it says ongoing in the description of REACT-1. REACT-1 uh, finished its last survey um, in, in March of this year, March 2022. But it was a set of, uh, so REACT-1 is a survey, set of surveys looking at the prevalence of infection, so testing for antigen and using PCR to do that. Uh, but they were individuals um, self uh, swabbing themselves and then submitting um, that sample for PCR testing. REACT2 was a study of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So what the seroprevalence was in um, the population. And so as is, um, you'd suspect by seroprevalence that required um, a blood sample to be collected. Again, that was um, self-collected because when you think about when these started in May and June of 2020, one, the scale of it was such that it wasn't possible to do this um, in other settings. And because we were actually in the process of um, sort of lockdown type um, non-pharmaceutical intervention. So those, those policies meant that we were all spending a lot of time at home. And so people were collecting those. There is a follow-on study looking at um, long COVID, REACT long COVID study, which looks at some of um, the participants, some of the participants from the other REACT surveys who then um, give data on their clinical history of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there's a series of these. I'm going to concentrate for the rest of the time on the REACT-1 study, which was where I was more involved. Um, but there's a, a large cast of characters involved in each of these. When you see the scale of it, you'll understand why. Um, and I will try and give uh, credit where credit is due to the large number of people that have brought this together. I'm but one um, piece in this very large puzzle that we all work together. Um, so that you are aware, uh, 
this gives you a snapshot of the uh, React website. So um, it'll also be put in the link. Uh, you can see here a lot of information from the React studies of different types. This shows you here a test kit um, that was what was used for the uh, React 2 study that where somebody was taking a blood sample um, of their own, but the different, um, depending on which study you were in, you would be sent a different sampling pack and then submit the samples through the matter at the time. So early on that involved a courier coming for the React 1 study. So a courier would come and maintain a cold chain. Um, I was in fact a participant as well of React 1 um, in 2020. And so swab myself, put the sample in uh, the refrigerator as instructed, and then the courier came at the scheduled time and then maintained a cold chain after that. Um, there were some changes that happened subsequently in how samples were handled, um, and I'll signpost those. That included uh, moving from a courier system to sending through post, um, changing from dry, dry to, to wet um, swab sampling, and you know, so maintaining those samples. Um, and also we moved from just testing for SARS-CoV-2 to testing for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza. But here for the rest of the talk, again, I'll only concentrate on SARS-CoV-2, but watch this space. We will be looking at um, evidence of uh, influenza transmission in this same population in future. Um, this shows the uh, pictures of the senior REACT investigators who were at Imperial College. Um, and you see, so this was bringing together people with expertise over a wide range of public health, including statistics, um, modeling, people who um, before largely worked on, on chronic diseases, but were in, interested in running very big studies because this is very large, people looking at diagnostics, um, both for antibodies and infection. And this was just the components of people who were working um, at Imperial College. So we had a logistics partner who's Ipsos Mori, um, and we had collaborators in other places, including Peter at Lancaster. So um, this really was a large group effort and it was funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. And as I already mentioned, it was then funded for England only. So that's what you'll be seeing today. Um, it started in the first lockdown in May, uh, the 1st of May, 2020. So React One, they um, sent letters out to, to random sample of people across um, England asking, that, and the, those were people who were aged five and older, asking them if they wanted to take part. Um, if people uh, indicated that they did want to take part either through the web um, or they could phone if they didn't want to do that. You see here the um, invitation letter that was actually sent to Paul Elliott, who was one of, ended up being a participant as well as director of the REACT program. So um, it's actually quite likely that many of you out there will have been uh, approached at some point because so many people, um, those out there who are in England, uh, have a good chance of having been approached at some time because we had 19 separate surveys over the course of this. So in each case, a cross-section of the population uh, randomly chosen was invited. Um, those people were selected from an NHS, that's a National Health Service list of patients who were registered in England that should have nearly 100% uh, coverage of the population. So either if it was a child, the parent or guardian, or the individual themselves would complete um, a registration, and then they would be sent through the post um, a swab kit if they were um, taking part in REACT 1 or a blood sampling kit if they were taking part in REACT 2 and instructions. After that, they um, swabbed themselves or took the blood and then completed a questionnaire online that would give um, information on demographic details, things like household composition, things about um, occupation, uh, but there were also behavioral things, for example, asking about shielding type behaviors and mask wearing. In addition, there was a question asking if people would be willing to have their individual record linked with their NHS record. And so um, in that way, we could get information on the details of their vaccination. Although we did ask individuals for their vaccination, um, for example, even people, not everyone who said they were vaccinated could provide a precise date, whereas if they, they provided consent, 
then we could link up their record and be sent um, information um, that was, you know, so I never saw names of anybody. It was all anonymized by the time I got it, but someone else linked up the NHS records and our REACT records. And then we could look at the detail of how long it had been, for example, since somebody had their second dose of vaccine in order to analyze that. Over the course of this, the 19 rounds, over 2 million people took part. So it's a very big study indeed. Just to give a scale of what it was, so, so the aim was to have at least 100,000 um, in each round. And this shows an example. So in rounds um, 16, we had slightly less um, than 100,000. We had 97,000. But um, in order to, to get those 100,000 people, so as you can see here, giving an example of rounds uh, 14, 15, and 16, which was from um, September to December, 2021, nearly a million people in each of these had invitations sent to them. And then there was considerable non-response. So the early on, we had over 30% of people who were approached took part. And that was, as I said, in, in May, um, 2020. So for one thing, that was the way that, unless you were really ill, the only way that you could get a test for infection because they weren't generally available at that point. Um, and also people were spending a lot of their time at home. So I think that um, combined with the fact that just the general concern over SARS-CoV-2, which was at that point relatively new and had, but having a big impact meant that we had an extreme, for this sort of scale and um, type of survey, extremely high um, response rate is over 30% is very high for this sort of thing. Um, in later rounds, it did go down. It um, ended up still at about 11% in the last round. So um, obviously not as high as we would have always liked it to stay all the way high, but we still had a considerable um, response rate. So at the very end, in the last two rounds, we actually had incentives that were given to particular underrepresented groups. Um, these tended to be young adults from um, non-white ethnicities were actually less likely to take part. Both when we did and didn't have incentives, we did though through Ipsos Mori get a, we're able to calculate when we look at prevalence, a weighted prevalence and that the weights, um, allowed us to adjust for the um, underrepresented groups. So people who did take part, but came from a group that otherwise was less likely um, to take part in the survey would get a higher weight than someone, for example, like me, who's a woman over 50, um, white ethnicity, um, was a group that probably had higher um, response rates. So in that way, then we were able to get as close as we could to a representative sample and representative um, estimate of what the prevalence was in the population. There's a lot of numbers on here, but I wanted to put everything in one place so that you could look at. You can see here the number of swabs that were tested in the different rounds. So you can see that you know we well exceeded um, 100,000 in these early rounds and went up as high as 174,000 in round five. You can see the dates here on the right-hand side of when these took place. As I said, they started with the first round in May of 2020 and ended at the very end of March 2022 with our 19th round. You see the number of positives when we divide those and get the unweighted prevalence, but then there's also the weighted prevalence, and that uses the weights that I mentioned, these rim weighting um, to adjust for some people being in groups that are more likely to take part than others. And so you can see that there is a general um, trend that we see um, a higher weighted prevalence than we have unweighted prevalence in each of these rounds. And that is because uh, the groups that were less likely to take part were also had a higher prevalence in what we, from what we were able to estimate. You do see though the last two rounds, 18 and 19, those that I mentioned where we had incentives in these underrepresented groups, we see that actually that was the first time in round uh, or well, the only time precisely in round 18 where our unweighted estimate was actually the same as the weighted one. And that shows the success of the um, incentivizing 
of individuals from particular groups to take part. There was still a small difference that we saw in round 19 that also used incentives. I highlighted this last estimate of the weighted prevalence, and I think the weighted one is the one we should concentrate on rather than unweighted because it does allow for this um, different differential participation rates, but it was high, was extremely high compared to what we've seen. I mean, if you think about, you know, when we started in May um, 2020, uh, we had a weighted prevalence of 0.16. So, um, you know, and then we thought it was very high when we got to round six and round eight. So those were in late 2020, early 2021, when it went over 1%, and we thought that was very high. Well, we hadn't seen what we what would later be seen as very high, which is, you know, then it went um, in round 15, which was in, from last October. Uh, we again surpassed a 1%, and it hadn't gone down since then. So it went up to over 4% in round 17, which was just after Christmas this year. And then it was the highest that we'd ever seen um, last month in March of 2022. And unfortunately, that was also the last uh, of the funded studies of, of REACT-1. So um, one of the journalists commented that we went out on the high, not the sort that we would have wanted to. But of course, the implications of those infections are really quite different for many people at this stage than they were early on because of the um, protection that we've gotten from vaccination to reduce our risks. It does, to some extent, uh, reduce the risk of testing positive, but uh, the primary function was to reduce the risk of um, very serious clinical outcomes, including hospitalization of, and deaths. And we've seen that that, you know, collectively, we've seen that that does a very good job. So 6% prevalence is extremely high, but nothing like what its clinical consequences would have been if that had happened um, in 2000 before we had widespread vaccination. Um, then those are just the um, headline figures from each round. And then for each round, this gives you an example of looking at rounds um, 16 and 17, which were from um, November to, uh, 2021 to January 2022. So just over the um, end of last year. And it showed how we then compared looking at different age groups. So I mentioned REACT-1 only um, considers people age five and older, um, but we saw a higher, significantly higher prevalence in both of these rounds in five to 11 year olds compared to 12 to 17 year olds. And of course, at this stage, 12 to 17 year olds were being offered vaccine, but five to 11 year olds weren't. Uh, and we see in round, um, 16, a pattern that we saw elsewhere, which is that when we saw relatively high, and although round 17 overall has a higher prevalence, if we just look at the relative amounts in, within round 16, there was high uh, prevalence in the youngest children, those five to 11 year olds. But then you see this double peak and the double peak, it corresponds to the, the age group that's likely to represent many of the parents of these children. And we saw that repeatedly where we saw high prevalence come up in the children. Um, then we often saw then either in that round or happened um, subsequently, then we saw this second peak appear in the um, parental age groups. We also looked at the demographics because I mentioned that within the questionnaire, we asked them questions about household um, composition. And so we both knew um, the number of people in the household and it was, um, true all the way through that people from larger households were more likely to test positive. Uh, but then we also looked um, at this stage and we started looking at um, whether or not there was one or more children in the home. And that was um, quite consistent in giving a higher risk of testing positive as well. So that doesn't prove which direction the um, transmission went, but Looking, taking all of this information together is certainly suggestive that we had, you know, we're seeing high prevalence in the children, which were the unvaccinated group um, of the ones that we are looking at. So the five to 11 year olds, because we didn't look younger than that. Um, and then their presence in the home was associated with a higher risk, including for adults. Um, what you see as well here between um, 16 and 17 is really 
you know, a surprising increase as well in the oldest age group, those 75 plus. So we saw, saw over this scale just between um, December to January at the end of last year, um, a jump of almost 12 fold in the prevalence of these 75 plus year olds. And although um, this is a group that is very highly vaccinated, um, there's also the issue that, you know, that one, it's not absolutely everyone. And two, um, we've seen um, evidence that, you know, over time, as the time since vaccination goes on, the risks do start to um, increase again. So it's, it's still a worry when we see um, high prevalences in those older age group because they're most vulnerable. We were also um, able to look at how this changed over time. Now, while I was first talking about what's the prevalence in a particular round, and at the start of it, that's you know how we looked at it. Okay, what's happening in a round? Also, because we did have um, almost always over a hundred thousand um, samples, we were able to not just look at the round as a whole, but to look at how we had changes even uh, over time within rounds. And this shows, if you look at the bottom, you see the time scale the start and the beginning of May, 2020, going up through um, the end of March, 2022. So it was almost monthly. There were gaps. So you see that there was a gap in um, December of 2020, which we may have been a time when we actually saw a local maximum, would have seen a local maximum um, in infections had we continued to sample then. And there was also, um, a gap that there wasn't one in August of 2021 corresponding to the holidays, but you can look in between those. So those are gaps over which we do not infer changes, but otherwise uh, we used a spline, which I will talk a bit more about in a moment um, to characterize those changes um, over time, both within rounds, but also between rounds. And so you see that you get more uncertainty obviously for good reason, um, when you're trying to estimate between rounds that within, and you know, it is not a mechanistic transmission, there's not a transmission model behind this, but it is a smoothing technique to try and characterize um, the changes over time to be responsive, but also a bit resilient to either underfitting or overfitting. Um, then, once we have an estimate of how the prevalence changes over time, and note, unlike some of the graphs that I'll show later, this is prevalence on a, a natural scale, um, we are able to estimate the instantaneous growth rate. So it'll be zero if the um, prevalence is staying stable. Um, if it is increasing, then it will be above zero, it will be positive, and that's where you see the indicated with the red color as being a bad thing. Um, estimates of the instantaneous growth rate below um, zero are negative, so that's declining prevalence. And so you can see over time how we had changes in, uh, you know, sort of times of increasing prevalence and decreasing prevalence. What the instantaneous growth rate doesn't tell you is whether or not you're getting um, growth or decline from a high plateau or a low one. If it's zero, it could be still high prevalence but constant, or it could be low prevalence and constant. And those are obviously very different from personal risk and public health points of view, but it does give you a measure, which is then in a way that I'll show you uh, shortly, uh, related to the estimate of the um, effective reproduction number. So what's the average number of new infections per infection? So I thought as well, it was useful to see this. So you can see the colors here show um, the different rounds. Um, and then here, at the, in the last graph, it shows the mobility relative to maximum over this period. So the period shown here um, is from April 2020 to uh, end of March 2022. And so each of these um, types of mobility is, is shown, it has a maximum at 100%. So relative to that, how did mobility change? Well, by the time we came in, in May 2020, we were already within the first lockdown. So there was, you know, relatively low mobility. And these are uh, measures of mobility from Apple, looking at um, you know, people's phones, giving an indication in an anonymized way of what the relative mobility was uh, from these different modes of transport. So they divided it up into driving, transit, and walking. 
And so you can see the gray background represents when we had periods of lockdown. So you see that gradually over this period when we were um, testing people in May, uh, the mobility was gradually starting to go up. It then was, you know, sort of it went up and then started to go down a little bit in um, late 2020. But then we see a, a precipitous drop corresponding to this period of the pre-Christmas -Christ lockdown. There was then a gap over Christmas. And then we had a longer lockdown again in early 2021, where you saw another big drop in um, mobility. That mobility drop, though, happened course before the actual lockdown themselves, corresponding to the Christmas period. But then it took much longer to come back. And that was sort of gradual. And um, since then, we've seen the drop again for mobility at Christmas time when people's behavior changes and then it's bounced back. So it gives you a feel for, and you can look to see, you know, here's periods of when there was relatively less mobility and mostly it was in the green zone of um, reduced transmission. Here, mobility goes up. It corresponds to a period of uh, increased transmission that's a sort of instantaneous growth rate was positive. Again, low mobility corresponds to more green, higher mobility corresponds to red. Um, in the curve, and this is the same curve that I showed you before, just a little bit larger. Um, this was fitting, so we defined a family of fourth order B spines, basis spines over the duration of the study. And then we had a linear combination of these B spines um, that were fit in a Bayesian uh, pen penalized spine or P spine model. And it was used to, as I said, try to model changes in the prevalence of what was strictly called swab positivity, uh, because this is unadjusted for sensitivity and specificity. So this is the prevalence of swabs that tested positive. Uh, but when we do this, we can look at, as you've seen, how does the prevalence change over time and what do we estimate from that, which is smoothing these curves a little bit and also um, giving us some uh, intuition between them. But we were able to, as I've shown you, estimate the exponential growth rate from them. We'll be able to estimate what, how are the reproduction number changed over time. Um, for with underfitting, how do we um, adjust for that? So we looked at um, how many knots we wanted to put into these spines. And we did a, about an average of one every five days, as well as putting a knot just on the outside of the uh, observed data to try and make sure that um, we protected ourselves against rogue um, sort of edge of data effects to the extent that we could. Uh, we did also put the, and this shows um, the last four rounds. So um, 16, 17, 18, and 19 rounds. So this is when you see the prevalence going up. It was very interesting in this last period, this March um, 2022, 20, um, where we saw the highest prevalence we've seen over 6%. But, and here we looked up, we weren't able to do this for a smaller age groups as I showed you in the one plot, because we still have to trade off more age groups versus smaller sample size. But we still have, as you can see, a fair bit of precision, even lumping all the kids together. Um, and we saw that that, that peaked, their prevalence peaked in mid-March. Uh, we had already seen evidence by the end of March of a seeming plateau in both the younger adults from 18 to 34, um, the more middle-aged group, um, 35 to 54. But then in the um, 55 and over group, um, we maybe saw the, the increase slowing down, but we hadn't seen a peak yet. Um, you know, subsequent data, which has been collected uh, by the ONS survey, which is also, has also been running for a different, um, different design over this period, um, did show that this is, has subsequently, the prevalence has subsequently declined in this oldest age group as well. But when we last had a picture of it, it was still going up. And that just gave us a very good um, insight as to what was going on. Now you could argue, well, what, what else could we have looked at? We could have looked at, uh, without setting up this whole big study, we could have looked at, well, what are case numbers? Are case numbers going up or down? But the difficulty with case numbers is it's not a random sample of people. And you have differences in behavior 
for example, sometimes people seeking tests more than others. Sometimes there, you know, there weren't tests generally available in May 2020, so that wasn't an option for people to seek them unless they were extremely ill and um, doctors uh, determined that they should be tested. So, um, so the number of detected cases at that point was um, a very small subset of the number of true infections that were out there. But even when tests became more available and all of us could sign up for free packs of um, lateral flow tests to do at home, um, there was still a matter that sometimes people would test more than others. And to be, for most of the time of this epidemic, to be a confirmed case, you had to have a follow-up PCR. Um, and there were times, for example, before Christmas that we were hearing stories of um, PCRs not being available. Some days lateral flow tests couldn't be found um, in some areas because there was so much demand for them with high prevalence. So that's why we want, you know, that's the benefit of this all the way through is it's taken a very consistent approach and we're getting a random sample of the population. Um, and so I talked about how we um, avoid underfitting and let this be responsive by putting in um, plenty of knots. To avoid overfitting, um, we have a prior and the prior is on the sort of second, a second order random walk um, of these B splines. And that allows us to have a good uh, trade-off between responsiveness, but I will show you what happens if we just looked at, if we had a, a first order um, random walk prior, when the data stopped, and this, these are simulated data, there was a tendency for the model very quickly to go to prevalence being flat, regardless of what it was doing before. Whereas if we had a second order random walk prior, what it tended to do, although of course, as you'd expect, as you get further from the data, um, you see a widening of the um, credible intervals, which is what you'd expect because there's more uncertainty, but it continued the trend from that point. Now, obviously, when you actually come to the last of all, you know, the last survey to date, as you know, was always the case when you're we reporting it, um, you would with much caution have to interpret the, the prediction that the current trend would continue. On the other hand, there was no reason to think that there would be um, a natural tendency for it to plateau and stay exactly the same. So this, this was a trade-off, but again, anytime you're projecting beyond the edge of the data, you need to have appropriate caution in doing that. Um, and so in addition to the, um, the estimate of the instantaneous growth rate, which we were able to obtain from our fitted spine, and I talked through that, we we're able to um, translate that into an estimate of the reproduction number, that average number of new infections per uh, one infection, um, using this equation from uh, Willinga and Lipsitch. And that essentially, so that needed the instantaneous growth rate um, and also um, characteristics from the uh, the incubation period distribution. So when we were, or not this incubation, but the um, serial interval distribution. And so combining those together, then we were able to translate the estimates of the instantaneous growth rate to estimates of the reproduction number. And plotted below here, you see estimates, which are a two week average of the um, instantaneous reproduction number, giving an effective reproduction number, and shown here in red on the same scale, because we could just use the bottom half of this um, for a probability, is the posterior probability uh, that R was greater than one over time. And you can see how we're able to, to characterize that. So even when our estimate is below um, one, so again, indicating that the instantaneous growth rate is negative, we're still able to characterize how, how um, confident are we of that given the data. Uh, we were able to look at um, how the risk of uh, being swab positive in our study varied over time. And you see here on the same um, color scale, because you know, when we were publishing as we went along with a different round, then we'd use a color scale appropriate to that round. Um, but you can see here using the same color scale throughout where we had a very high prevalence um, pretty much through the whole of, of England throughout, although the very highest areas um, were here in 
in the southwest and also there in the east of England. Um, we had seen previously in round 17, for example, that the highest risks were in the north and a little bit here in England. Um, but you know, then by comparison around 16, the prevalence everywhere was relatively low. So we're able to see this coming and going. And it wasn't always the same areas were um, at the highest risk as you've seen here, um, some of the things. So that will be partly because if it's been high in one area for quite some time, then there would be a buildup of um, some level of naturally acquired immunity, at least for some period of time, as well as whatever level of vaccine immunity they had at that point. Um, but it's just likely because we did have um, movements between areas, especially when it wasn't locked down, that there would be, you know, there were introductions everywhere and everywhere had high prevalence, high prevalence at some point, at least relative to the rest of the country at that point. We were also able to look at for the positives. We were able to send the positive um, samples off to be sequenced. Now, um, for example, this is round um, 17. And in that case, we had just over 3,000 positive samples um, that were uh, sent for sequencing. And so for those, and we sent, um, after some um, testing, we sent the ones that were relatively um, high viral load because of the more limited success on the um, samples that had very low viral loads. But looking at um, those samples that had at least 50% genome coverage, we were able to get identify lineages, um, variants, and sublineages um, for over 2,300, in this case, um, positive samples. And what you see is at this stage in round 17, that we just saw the very end of uh, Delta being in the UK, and we were seeing the predominance of Omicron. But this was um, at the stage where we were almost, all of this was still BA1 or its sublineage, its sublineage BA1.1, which together made up some 98% of the samples. And then we just saw a very small number of BA2, which subsequently um, went to almost completely replace BA1. So we could watch these um, replacements going on by um, typing these positives. And this showed at, shows as we were able to characterize it, um, the replacement of different types. So here looking, oh, I didn't put the years on these things. Okay, so this was in 2021. And this was um, the this shows um, the daily proportion of Delta variant compared to Alpha, um, and it showed how you know we went through. We were first um, just started to see um, some Delta appearing here in in April, and then by the time we get to late May, June, we have days where we're seeing that it's all Delta, and then by the time we get to July, we don't see any Alpha at all. So we are able to fit models looking at the transition between those um, and we get slightly different estimates depending on whether or not we include the extreme rounds of 10 and 13 here or just the estimate from just 11 and 12. But either way, the estimates are really quite similar. We were then able to characterize here um, the proportion that were Omicron compared to Delta. This is round 16. So this is November to December um, 2021. And note that the scale, the, um, the day scale is very different here. These are individual days in both cases, but these are spread further out. So this is just within a single round. And we saw it going from no Omicron to the um, estimate from the model giving us over 75% um, estimated to be Omicron by then. And then finally, you can see that within Omicron, I was pointing out to you at that early stage, um, and this round here, we just had 19 um, BA2s, but we see then very quickly again, and they're able to monitor um, the replacement of, in this case, BA2 and its sublineages replacing all other types, or almost complete replacement of all other types of Omicron. So we were able to identify these at quite an early stage uh, relative to their identification outside of React, and then see the replacement of these. 
even though you know we only had rounds going typically every month and so we do have substantial gaps in terms of number of days between rounds in, in most cases we were also so this shows you on a this is again prevalence of swab positivity so the prevalence curves um, that you've seen before this particular um, one shows you up through um, round 17 i think um, and so that's what you see in black. You see, it looks slightly different than what we saw before because it's on a log scale. But then for comparison, our um, curves fit in the same B spine sort of way to um, hospitalizations and, so hospitalizations in blue and deaths in red. So they have the scales that are on the second Y axis, which is shown on the right hand side. And what we found was that by um, estimating a scaling and delay factor, so scaling to get the scaling the number of deaths down to the uh, scale of the prevalence, and also shifting the deaths back for a time lag. So initially we were estimated a 25 day time lag for um, deaths and a, a um, 19 day one for hospitalizations. You can see that when we fitted this up through the, this is showing um, 2020, we saw a quite a close correlation between the pattern over time in the prevalence that we were estimating in, within React and um, the deaths that were being observed some 25 days later. Um, and, you know, and then for hospitalizations, we had a, a smaller gap in the shift but again, you know, these were showing relatively close correlation. We do see a little bit of pulling apart here in the um, sort of summer of 2020, but the pattern is otherwise really extremely correlated. And then in January 2021, the uh, we have the beginning of the widespread vaccination program, and then you can see really, you know, a sustained difference between the rate when we use the same, same scaling factor of the difference between the rate of deaths that were observed compared to what we might've expected compared to prevalence. Um, with hospitalizations, um, we see it, it tracks a bit more closely than it did with deaths. So we do, do see some um, pulling away here as the uh, vaccination rate gets going. Um, but then it comes back together here. This is the period when we had um, the Delta variant coming in, and then you see it coming a bit closer together here um, in the Omicron period. However, it really, I think quite dramatically shows um, the success. And this is not fitting any sort of other mechanistic model. This is really just um, scaling and shifting with a time lag the deaths and separately the hospitalizations, comparing them to our prevalence level and showing them on a long scale. Um, you, we do have this dotted line and the dotted line here was for the fact that um, when we um, had a change in variance, um, we is observed that there was a shorter time appearing to, to be the appropriate time lag. So this is, this is a refit of the time lag but the same scaling parameter after this dotted line in the middle of uh, June 2021. We were also able to look at vaccination. This gives you a feel for the vaccination coverage by age, for example, in round 16. And um, as you'd expect, we saw um, very much higher vaccination rates in the older age groups. Um, it, at this point, only adults had been offered um, third vaccines unless they, people were extremely vulnerable, and we had almost completely unvaccinated uh, five to 11 year olds. We did see considerable vaccination though at this point, even in the 12 to 17 year olds. And so using that data, while we still had substantial numbers of unvaccinated individuals, we were able to estimate from our model using odds ratios, what the vaccine effectiveness was, um, but then we were also able to look at um, adjusting those for, for example, age group and sex. Um, IMD stands for 
uh, it's a it's a measure of deprivation, and so it's quintile of deprivation, index of multiple deprivation, region and ethnicity, and so you can see um, measures of vaccine effectiveness compared to self-reported vaccine status um, and linked vaccine status, depending on which line of this you look for. Um, and so then we were able to look at protection against all infections against symptomatic infections, uh, which was greater effectiveness. Um, and those were sustained even if we adjusted for these other covariates, so that's encouraging. I just wanna point out before I finish that other people have already been analyzing data and there are um, measures afoot to um, facilitate other people doing secondary analysis and getting um, appropriate levels of access um, to React data. Some of it is available in a uh, very grouped form on GitHub already corresponding to the publications, uh, but this is an example of a publication including people uh, such as Chris Holmes um, came out of people associated with Turing and elsewhere. I think Peter was on this as well, looking at um, analysis of targeted testing data. So that's like test and trace, where you're testing people who either are symptomatic or have been exposed um, and considering in parallel randomized surveillance data. So data like React. And so looking at causal diagrams and really trying to, to break the link between why people are getting tested and having these confounders affect both whether or not you get infected and whether or not you get tested and use that to calibrate. So trying to look at debiasing, because although we have a huge amount of data in React, there's an even huger amount of data in test and trace. And to be able to um, make best use of that, if you can have a debiasing model behind that and bring all the information together, that has to be um, a very good way forward. So it's just an example of somebody else using data. Um, and people have been talking about, and I've mentioned the ONS survey, there was React as well. I mean, people in um, both within the UK and internationally, Natalie Dean from the US, for example, have been talking about the importance of having um, these random samples of the population in order to really understand what's going on within an epidemic and trying to set these systems up so they will, will be ready, ready in future. We were, I think, as a community quite responsive in being able to get React off the ground um, in May 2020, which was very quick in the scheme of things given the scale of it. Um, but hopefully, should we face another similar threat uh, in future, we could be even faster. So um, I wanted to uh, thank all the co-authors and the people who've been involved in these surveys. And this shows you some of the pictures of the um, postdocs and students who've been involved as well, who weren't sort of investigators in having set the thing up, but have contributed hugely um, to the analyses that have been undertaken. Um, and Ipsos Morin, I just wanted to show an example here of some of the um, visualizations that they have created and um, circulated with every single round, trying to make the results more accessible. So while I think in terms of prevalence is either a proportion or percentage, they're saying, okay, here, the prevalence this time was equivalent to 637 people in every 10,000. And trying to show these in terms of pictures of little people to really help people visualize them, as well as showing the prevalence, you know, this is a curve showing the prevalence by age group, but, but make it as accessible as possible. So um, finally wanted to thank not just those who I've worked with who are for whom I'm very grateful, but the people who participated, uh, collaborated and of course the funders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, really very, very good uh, review of the React survey. Uh, uh, some of you will have noticed, as Dee Senior put in the chat, if, if you'd like to post questions in the Q&A, we'll see if we get any consensus on what the burning, most burning questions are. Uh, and uh, while people are doing that, I'll, I'll just kick off with a, uh, uh, to get your thoughts on this general issue, Crystal. I, from my point of view, I'm speaking personally, the, the singular value of React compared with other surveys of COVID prevalence in the UK is the study design. Uh, and the scale was nice, but the study design was the singular point. And uh, what, what do you see as the prospects for some continuing form of randomized uh, survey, repeated cross-sectional survey 
because the time to do surveillance is when you don't have a problem, right? And then you're better prepared when you do have the next problem. Yes, yeah, so well, we specifically had um, Mark Lipsich and colleagues come and visit us from um, the United States. And so he has, Mark Lipsich has been working with others, um, setting up new surveillance capacity within the US CDC. So they're talking about sort of gearing up now, even though, as you said, it's, it's a relatively late stage in terms of COVID, so that they have this capacity going forward. I mean, I think there will be, you know, there'll be a lot of time for reflection and thinking how this capacity gets, you know, sort of strengthened uh, and made accessible and whether or not it would be possible, for example, to get it going in all parts of the UK, not just England saying, oh, well, this is a bit, you know, th this is what we think the comparison is with other uh, countries. But as you've mentioned yet, yeah, it is different in that it being cross-sectional. There are therefore some questions it can't answer, for example, about reinfection, because there are relative, you know, that we hardly had any, we didn't, it's not zero, but we had a very small amount of overlap between some of the surveys. Uh, um, yes, yeah. But the vast majority were that not there. So there are things that we can't do, but the fact that we keep getting you know, these cross-sectional surveys that are one large, you know, very highly representative and, and by design randomized, I think is a real strength. And I think that will be recognized and there will be discussion both within ourselves and colleagues at the Royal Statistics Society and other epidemiological and statistical colleagues, but also, you know, this is something that we really have to discuss um, when we go to the inquiry about the, the contributions that can be made. I mean, I think, you know, I'm somebody who, who straddles the statistical epidemiological infectious disease modeling sort of side. But I think it, it's really important that we have all of these components and you know, the React, the you know, purely descriptive things about React have been hugely informative as well as the fact that they will be able to inform other types of modeling going forward. Uh, yes, and I mean, on that uh, uh, repeated measurements uh, issue, because there's, there's a certain complementarity between React and the ONS surveys, and it would be kind well, of nice was. if those two <laughs> things could be combined yeah. in an optimal manner, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But, but now we only have one, but you know, many countries didn't have any of mm, that sure. sort of thing, magnitude going on. So um, you know, we were in an extremely strong position compared to many other countries. Indeed. <clears throat> D. Emma, I'm looking to you if I'm being technically incompetent. I can't see any questions for the or from the audience at the moment, and maybe that I'm looking in the wrong place. No, we're not looking in the wrong place. No questions coming in at the moment. Uh, I, I could I could quiz Crystal for hours. Um, Go ahead. We've got six minutes left. Yeah. Take the floor, yeah. Okay. So I want to ask you a more technical question, Crystal, because I absolutely get it that for surveys of this kind, the compliance rate is high. But that still doesn't deny the fact that it's low. And what your weighting does is it corrects for underrepresentation of particular strata of the population. What it can't do is correct for underrepresentation of people within each strata who are atypically high at high, at high risk. And so, if the association that you found between the area level compliance and the area level risk, which is implied by that difference. If that's matched individual level, you do have some non-compliance bias. And it's, I can't see how you can quantify that with uh, within React. You'd have to do a sort of prospective study to, to get a handle on yeah, it. Yeah, so obviously, yeah, we're, we're limited by the things that, uh, the, where the people had recorded them. Um, we have done a little bit of looking at um, people who um, agreed to take part and then didn't have um, valid results to give us one more step. Yeah. in that, um, which is interesting because we do see some differences between those people. Um, so whether they're dropping out of that, but um, you know, it, it, it is an inevitable challenge. I and mean, um, Ipsos Mori does this sort of calculating of these weights all the time, but they're inevitably limited by, by what can be reported. And if there are these other components of something that are, are important, then it, it is certainly a limitation, but you know, and it's possible, of course, that having, uh, you know, that the same thing may be affecting people not showing up in React and not showing up in ONS, in which case the cross calibration doesn't help yeah. that much. But we did um, take part in weekly meetings in which we inputted whatever our latest results were to a thing called the Data Directorate Group, 
and we brought together you know, representatives from big studies, both um, who were doing wastewater sampling, who were um, looking at ZOE, REACT, ONS, and others and whenever there was another uh, relevant study to try and bring all those different perspectives together. And of course, wastewater sampling is quite a different direction to look at it, but still, you know, you'd expect to find, well, it's gonna be higher in the areas where we have um, a higher prevalence. It doesn't get at the same sort of demographics other than spatially, but it can help you calibrate things and make sure that, you know, that you're not way out in a particular area. Unfortunately, the one question that somebody has asked uh, that I saw come through. No, there, maybe there is one. I, somebody asked about um, response rates by area. And that's actually something that I don't, I don't remember uh, whether or not there is any different by um, geographic region, but I did see that flash up. Um, well, the things you adjust for are proxies for area, things like yeah. deprivation and ethnicity are strongly spatial yes. structured. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, sort of age group and the, those sort of things, yeah. Yeah, uh, the question that has come through the Q&A, and please do keep coming them in the Q&A because then people can add their popularity to it. Isabella Deutsch has asked, and at least two people have said yes, please. Would there be merit in doing similar survey screening for, much, for many more diseases, e.g. flu? Okay, well, certainly we did think so because we were, um, managed to make the case and got further funding to um, run multiplex tests for the, the latest round. So we do have rounds. We haven't yet reported on those, but we will do going forward on what we saw in terms of flu, because we need to do some sequencing of the results that we did get. So yes, I think that would be um, extremely useful. I think that's that's what is definitely in mind of those at the CDC in the US who are thinking of getting this set up. And I, I flashed up a couple of the, those commentaries. Um, those, those were discussing not just COVID, but for other diseases as well, and trying to get these things going forward. But it, I think the response rate is going to be a bigger challenge when we talk about doing this, you know, in um, in the time when it's not not a crisis or an ongoing crisis, as this has been for two years, but convincing people that it's worth their while um, to take part when they don't don't necessarily see what the point is at that particular time. There's not an emergency. Indeed. Um, well, I'm going to abuse my position again, unless somebody puts another Q and A question up very quickly, which is that what one. One potential way around that is data synthesis, because it seems to me if you can combine the volume of routinely recorded data with the robustness of a smaller scale randomized survey, you can sort of get the best of both worlds. And things like combining you know, routine electronic health records and wastewater records and so on with a sort of a, an anchoring randomized survey, which would have to be on a much smaller scale than reacts to be affordable in the long term might be a good kind of uh, combination strategy. Again, I saw a question flash up. Uh, maybe it's, it was in the chat because it's not in the Q&A. Yeah, I can see uh, it now, Crystal. Something yeah. about uh, HIV. Yeah, so please take it. Yeah, can, the question, everyone, is can you do uh, like the HIV testing, anonymous sampling of blood samples sent to hospitals for testing? So um, certainly it is possible to get um, ethical approval. And I'm um, on a study where we've done um, ethics approved uh, anonymized testing of residual blood samples that had been stored. And what, what's amazing about that is it, it, essentially, it gives you an opportunity. Now that's testing blood. So it's testing for antibodies, which is different. Um, and unfortunately, both from the point of view of sustained um, immune response, as well as from the point of view of testing, um, it's not clear that we can find an antibody that will last forever, because that's what you'd really like to know is the cumulative risk. Um, and so then you could test over time blood samples that are stored at different time. And by the difference in those, when you see the cumulative probability of having antibodies go up, you know that there's been incidents in that time period. So you'd be able to reconstruct what the incidence curve was, at least for first infections, if you had persistent antibodies that you can detect in these things. So our, our ability to identify those may improve over time. I'm not an immunologist, but you know, there have been some of the things that people have tested for, we've seen over time, the prevalence has gone down when there've been periods of lower incidence, which means that pe some people are losing antibodies. Um, but it certainly is there and with appropriate protections, um, it can be possible to get ethical approval to look at 
um, these stored blood samples for people who gave them for other purposes. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, we're we're officially uh, out of time, and I can see numbers are beginning to drop. So, uh, as I say, I could carry on uh, on this for hours, but that's not a good idea. So, I think I should formally close the proceedings. D. Do we have a date for the next lecture for people to take a note of? Hi, sorry, could unmute there. It's um, in May and we're expecting uh, Brahma Mukherjee to be speaking with us. I've put the link in the chat and I will do so again if you'd like to register. Yeah, so please, uh, please do uh, uh, keep in touch with this series. We're running this series through until the summer and beyond that, who knows? But uh, certainly I'd like to thank Crystal for that, that very lovely uh, walk through the React server, which... Uh, um, I think, you know, all credit to the Imperial team for setting this up in the first place and sustaining it so long at such a high scale. It's an enormous effort and uh, has a lot of value uh, for uh, researchers to really dig into what's been learned over the last two years, as I say, because uh, it's got lessons for the future, at least as much as lessons for uh, the, uh, the COVID epidemic. And we're getting some very appreciative comments through in the chat, which doesn't surprise me at all. So thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you to the audience for attending and please do keep in touch and uh, Dee would welcome your feedback uh, on any aspect of the lecture. Thanks everybody and goodbye. Thank you.